Hello, welcome to this video. It's the first video in a series of five about experiments in the digital age. This is material that's covered in chapter four of Bit by Bit. So I wanna start off with an example that I think does a great job of illustrating the power of experiments and also illustrating what is new, what is new about experiments in the digital age. This is a paper by Recibo and Van der Rijt. And so what they're interested in is the effect of awards on contributions to Wikipedia. And so the reason they were interested in this, there's a long-standing interest among social scientists in contributions to public goods. That is, why do people contribute to public goods where everyone can benefit from them, but where you can't restrict the benefits to only people who've contributed? Um, so social scientists have been interested in this puzzle for a long time. And Wikipedia is a beautiful example of a public good where contributions are recorded. And so they were interested in giving people awards. These awards are called barn stars. Um, they don't come with any monetary value, but they're a sign of recognition in this community. Um, and so what uh, the researchers did is they picked uh, qualifying, deserving researchers, deserving editors who had not received a barn star before. And then they randomly gave some of them barn stars. And then they were going to study how much they edited after receiving the barn star. And so what they found is that people who received a barn star actually edited less afterwards. So this might be totally contrary to what you would expect, which is winning an award would encourage you to contribute more. Fortunately, they didn't just give out awards. They also had a control condition people that they did not give awards to. And what they found is that people in the control group contributed even less afterwards. So everyone's contribution went down and the people who were in the treatment group went down less. And so in this way, the barn stars actually increased contribution relative to what would have happened without them. The reason for this pattern is that they found that Wikipedia editing is generally bursty. And so someone has to have a burst of work to show up in the top 1% of editors. These are the people who they con considered giving awards to. And so once you enter this top 1%, usually that burst ends and your ed contribution goes down over time. And so in the presence of these, this bursty behavior, without having a control group, you would reach exactly the wrong conclusion. So this, I think, illustrates the power of randomized controlled experiments to make sure that we're not fooling ourselves when we do something in the world it's very important to have a randomized control group that we can then compare the subsequent outcomes against to measure the effect of what we're doing. So this kind of story that is probably one that you've heard before about the power of randomized control experiments and the importance of a control condition. So let's take a step back and think about what experiments really are. So I think experiments generally have four common elements. So first is you recruiting participants randomization of treatment, delivering the treatment and control. So I, I'm gonna talk about delivering the control because it's often the case that you don't want the people in the control group to receive the treatment. And so in some sense you are delivering a control. And then finally you have to measure the subsequent outcomes. And so if we look at the Vestiva and Rand Van der Rijt paper, uh, we see that in their paper, all four of these steps were fully digital. Recruiting participants happened fully digitally. Randomizing the treatment was fully digital. Delivering the treatment and control was fully digital. And measuring the outcomes was fully digital. So this experiment has the same elements that traditional analog age experiments have, but it's done in a fully digital environment, which means there is uh, zero variable cost data. So their uh, experiment had 200 participants, but it could have very easily had 2,000, 20,000, 200,000. So if you think about an analog experiment, generally to double the number of participants costs twice as much. To have 10 times as many participants costs 10 times as much. In a fully digital experiment, you get zero variable cost. And so this allows you to have very, very large experiments. And so what that means though is the constraint on experiments is uh, on the size of an experiment no longer comes from the cost. And I think increasingly it will come from ethics. So in this case, the reason why Van der Rijt and Restivo did not have 20,000 or 200,000 participants is because giving that many awards would have messed up the Wikipedia ecosystem. This is actually a really great example 
of how we have to think about the ethics uh, of harm, not just to individuals, but also to communities. So no individual would be harmed if Recibo and Van Der Rijt gave out many awards. In fact, many people would be happy to get awards. However, that would throw off the Wikipedia ecosystem and would end up harming that entire community. So there can be harms to community, even if there are no harms to individuals. And so we can see from this, uh, the Restivo and Van Der Rey paper, I think there's three important takeaways. First is the importance of, of randomized controlled experiments for making causal claims and how having a control condition can help avoid, prevent you from making the exactly wrong conclusion. I think we can see how digital age experiments have many of the same elements as analog age experiments, but the more of those are run through digital um, systems, the more we can do new kinds of things like create zero variable cost data. And then the third thing I think it illustrates is that digital experiments often have different ethical considerations than analog experiments. Uh, obviously there's an overlap, but I think some ethical issues come up more in digital age experiments. So I want to make a note on terminology as in these videos I'm going to talk about experiments, but in English we often use the word experiment to mean I'm going to try something new. So I might say I'm going to experiment with a new pasta sauce recipe tonight. And these are sometimes called perturb and observe experiments. So you do something and then you measure the results. So do my kids like this pasta sauce or not? Um, when I talk about experiments, however, I'm going to mean them in a different sense. Uh, more particularly, I'm going to mean randomized controlled experiments. So we do have some treatment that we want to deliver, but we also have a control group and who gets assigned to the treatment group and who gets assigned to the control group is through randomization. And so it turns out you can learn much more from randomized controlled experiments than you can from simple perturb and observe experiments where there's no randomization and no control group. So even though I'm going to use the word experiment, I mean something very specific, a randomized controlled experiment. Just to talk again about the value of randomized controlled experiments, I think um, this quote by Gary Loveman does it wonderfully. Loveman is the CEO of Harris Casino, and he says, it's like you don't harass women, you don't steal, and you've got to have a control group. This is one of the things that you can lose your job for at Harris, not running a control group. So I think I love this quote because it, one, illustrates the importance of randomized controlled experiments for generating reliable knowledge. Um, and two, it, is it also emphasizes that the value of experiments can come not from doing something in the world, creating a treatment and doing something. People love creating new things and doing them, but in actually holding back some people who don't receive that new thing. And so often the value of experiments can come not just from creating a treatment and deploying it, but from creating a control condition and ensuring that that happens. So sometimes we create a randomized controlled experiment by creating a treatment group, but sometimes we can create it by um, creating a control group. So social scientists have done experiments for a long time. It's a technique that's allowed us to learn a lot of things about the social world. I think social scientists generally put these kinds of experiments into two buckets. There are lab experiments and there are field experiments. So this is also a continuum. There are things in between, but I'm going to talk most about these two extreme elements. So at one extreme are lab experiments. So this is maybe kind of prototypical example would be a kind of psychology 101 experiment. So those are done in an artificial setting, usually a lab setting on campus, usually an artificial task, a task that doesn't appear in the normal environment with artificial stakes. Usually the um, people are paid to do these things and the payment is unrelated to what they actually do in the experiment. And usually it's participants who are college students who are not necessarily the target population of interest, but they just happen to be a convenient population that's available. So lab experiments are really great for learning about certain kinds of things. So if you have a very subtle theory that requires very precise control over the environment to test, lab experiments are wonderful. However, increasingly social scientists have been concerned about what you can not learn from a lab experiment. And so they've started to do more, more field experiments, or these are sometimes called experiments in the wild, where the treatment is much more like treatments that naturally occur. The participants are much more like participants who would normally receive this treatment. The stakes are much higher and usually real outcomes in these people's lives. And, um, so for these reasons, field experiments are somehow sometimes 
considered more realistic, um, but they're also harder to do very subtle kinds of manipulations because in the field you have much less control over the environment than you do in a lab. So the strengths and weaknesses of field experiments and lab experiments are things that social scientists have debated for a long time. And I think what is new, those trade-offs are still there, but what's new is I think now we have a new dimension along which experiments can vary. So from analog to digital. And so we've seen examples of analog lab experiments and analog field experiments, and I think we will increasingly see examples of experiments that use more and more digital infrastructure. So to imagine filling out this space, this two by two quadrant, so uh, lab analog experiments, those are, for example, uh, the Corel et al. paper, which I talk about in bit by bit. So this you can think of as kind of a standard Psych 101 experiment. And then as we take more and more advantage of the digital infrastructure, we can still do lab style experiments. So a lot of these are happening on uh, platforms like Amazon Mechanical Turk. So Huber et al. is another paper I talk about in bit by bit where they do a very subtle experiment on Mechanical Turk. So by running the experiment on Mechanical Turk, they can take advantage of some of speed and scale that's created by digital infrastructure. And that experiment still has the strengths and the weaknesses that come from doing a lab style experiment. So as we move now to the other part of this two by two and talk more about field experiments, there are examples of analog field experiments. The Schultz et al. is one I'll talk about in a later video. And then there are also now more digital field experiments like Vecivo, Restivo and Van der Rijt, the experiment I just talked about on Wikipedia. So by taking advantage of the digital infrastructure, they were able to run a field experiment with zero variable cost. And so a lot of the trade-offs we've thought about before still exist, and I think the analog to digital dimension adds in new trade-offs that we have to consider as we design our experiments. So that is the first video in a series of five videos about uh, experiments in the digital age, and in the next video I'll talk about how we can use what's been learned in the past in social science to move beyond simple experiments, do things more sophisticated than A-B tests to help learn more from the experiments we're able to do in the digital age. Thank you.